Welcome to USSO's Eyes on the Fence. Hello and welcome to the second part of my interview with Christopher Vierpel, Neil Westreich Curator of Post-1800 Paintings at the National Gallery in London. We discussed the exhibition Wizard of the Home of Force of Nature last week and talked about Homer's life during the Civil War and his depiction of black figures in his art. If you haven't listened to that episode, please do give it a listen. And today, however, we'll talk about Homer's transnational vision, his portrayals of nature, the infinitely complex world of London art, and the benefits of bringing US painters across the Atlantic. Another thing we should say at this point is that there is an intense transnational focus here. He's a painter who traveled extraordinarily far across the Caribbean to um, England and the North Sea, as you just mentioned. No, I, I think he was very, very, um, very, very conscious of the triangular trade uh, uh, across the Atlantic South, bringing slaves, then up north, cotton, bringing cotton to Europe and Europe financing of the slave trade for centuries, um, which is is why we have focused so, so intently in the exhibition on his imagery of the Atlantic from both sides, as mm. it were. And I guess the one uniting factor of that and probably the most commonly identified aspect of Homer's paintings is the sea. Um, obviously, the exhibition the theme of this is force of nature. In addition to all those political and historical resonances, which you talked about, with Key West being on the boat in the Gulf Stream, for example, why was struggle with nature so important? And indeed, could you just expand on that suggestion that there is something referencing doubt about the American polity and the American future within um, the risk and danger that is evoked in his depiction of nature? Uh, well, uh, let me use an example. We have an amazing watercolor in the exhibition called Channel Bass of 1904, showing a bass who's been hooked. He's in a stream, somewhere. he's been hooked. He's about to be pulled out of the water to his death. Uh, and one of a number of images of animals at the moment in which we kill them. Um, mm. But what is fascinating, this picture already of 1904, the bottom of the channel where this fish is swimming is absolutely littered with bottles and other garbage that has been to tossed into the water. Another bottle at the upper left has just been thrown in. Even in 1904, in this image, Homer is saying, we're doing something wrong here. Mm. We're spoiling this Eden we've been, we've been given. Look at already the amount of garbage that is in the water. And it's, it's extraordinarily prescient for him to have picked that up. Mm. And I think that's what he goes on about over and again about our, the ambiguity of our relationship to nature. And then, in, of course, in the final decade of his life, and he dies in, in 1910, um, the, his landscapes, the human figure almost entirely disappears. It comes down to an elemental confrontation of nature, storm, water, waves, the rocks on the, on the main, uh, main shore. That's all. It, it becomes, dare I say, pure allegory of a, of a kind of relentless struggle. What do you think determined that shift? Is it as simple as Homer's old age, or was there something bigger in the political climate? Um, uh, I think he was an irascible old Yankee. I think he also liked performing the irascible old Yankee. It was a reality, but it was also a, a position he was taking in the world, uh, a, a certain statement of, of uh, American or Yankee self-reliance that had already been prepared by, by literature, by Emerson, by Whitman, whom you, uh, whom you want. And he was, was playing it without, you know, he had at uh, Prout's Neck a sign uh, on his front door, snakes, snakes, danger, stay away, you know, just uh, <laughs> uh, he, he, he wanted to be with himself. Uh, but at the, uh, at the same time, he wanted to say something about a certain notion of American singularity and American mm. independence. 
so is there a conception of American exceptionalism or in a sense, would you see Homer as someone who's artist, who's commentating in a different medium on that very, very quintessential American theme of the frontier? Yes, but uh, but uh, at the same time, I think we can't underestimate his awareness of politics, of political yeah. issues, um, of uh, seeing that he was in a very complicated um, political environment and that it redounded mm. beyond uh, the shores of of America. It truly was uh, international. Um, but he never, self-consciously, he never provided answers. Mm. He merely, as it were, he would have, I think, said of himself that he was merely an observer. And I think he's, you know, he's always been, even from his own lifetime and undiminished today, uh, he has been a much loved American artist. Uh, but I think that a lot of um, undermining of the difficulty of what he's saying to us has been there. And he's been turned into somebody sweet and recording mm. bucolic America. Yeah. Um, and I think he would, if he, if he ever got together the answer, he would have objected to that. He, it's not all sweetness and light. And it reflects something, I guess, on his disinclination to explain or explicate some of his themes that such reputation in the future can um, arise. I'm sure that makes preparing any kind of art exhibition or um, a book or catalog as you have done on him, particularly uh, both difficult, but also rewarding uh, because there's a lot to be set and to be yeah, claimed well, there. The, there is a, I don't want to say a problem with Homer, but it's probably the largest literature of any American mm. artist, except maybe now Warhol is bigger, but it, it, yeah. is, it is a huge literature and everything that has been said, the opposite has also been said. And it's very difficult to negotiate your way through this. So our decision with our colleagues from the Met to focus on this notion of conflict, what is he saying about conflict, yeah. natural, political, social, moral? Uh, yeah. How does that allow us to begin to, to carve a way through, through this giant career? Yeah, thank you so much. I could talk about Homer um, all day, clearly. But um, to zoom out, um, <laughs> aside from Homer as we're um, approaching the harshly circumscribed time limit of Zoom meetings. <laughs> um, to zoom out, Winslow Homer Force of Nature is one among several exhibitions introducing American artists to UK and European audiences in collaboration, as you said, uh, just then with the Met um, in New York. For example, there's been exhibitions on George Bellows and the Ashcan painters, Frederick Church and Thomas Cole. Why do you think it's so important to exhibit American artists in the UK and Europe, particularly those like Homer, which are more known in America than they are here on the other side of the Atlantic? And what are kind of the long term goals of this collaboration and partnership in doing so? Well, one of the things since I've been at the National Gallery that we have been very committed to doing is enlarging the mandate, enlarging mm. it beyond a certain polite European tradition of uh, representational painting and to really bring in the wider world. And when you want to bring in the wider world, America is, the United States at least, is the first stop. Its implications <laughs> in our life and our implication in its life from the beginning have been so complex and so um, uh, complicated uh, that it's necessary, I think, to for us to know these people who um, uh, who've made such a difference in defining America. Now, one of the reasons there are so very few Homer paintings in Europe is that he was always admired, always collected in America, and there was never anything to come here. Uh, mm. Nonetheless, we have to understand the role he played at home and, and begin to weave it into our understanding of a larger modernism emerging in the late 19th, early 20th century. Thank you so much. It's a um, excellent time to be interested in American art in London, both with Windsor Homer and Souls Grow Deep Like Rivers, um, a exhibition of artists from the American South arriving next year. Finally, I wondered if I could just ask one more question. Um, 
based upon your distinguished career um, that we talked about earlier. The art world in London, it's a chaotic, competitive, but immensely rewarding career, um, but one that probably feels quite detached from the world of scholarship and academic settings for many of us and for many of our listeners. <laughs> Do you have any advice for someone in an academic setting, whether they be a professor or doctor, or whether they be someone studying American art, politics, history um, for a PhD or master's or undergrad degree, who wants to get involved in this world or carve out a career within this setting? We are, uh, as we expand our mandate, as we look at newer uh, issues, we are not at all afraid of interpretation. We want to know what the young scholars are thinking what issues they think are important. Uh, and so we're always open, one, to ideas for exhibitions, but also for collaboration mm. on exhibitions where new um, uh, perspectives from social history, from political history, from military history even, indeed feed into understanding these complicated uh, issues. So we want to be a place of scholarship but not, not just of art history, of, of yeah. a wider conception. Okay, fantastic. And I'm sure your insightful answers today will work towards that. And so thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and give us these fascinating um, reflections. Um, <laughs> congratulations on this exhibit, on all the hard work you've done thus far. And I hope that by January 8th, you will uh, be able to reflect on the well-attended and creative <laughs> exhibition, which I hope will work towards um, those goals. So, Christopher, thank you so much. Thank you, Tom.